<laughs> so I am very honored to be joined this evening by my very good friend, Heiko Vermeulen, from the Portaferry Permaculture Project, author of Lightfoot Guide to Foraging, Wild Foods by the Wayside. How are you doing this evening, Heiko? <laughs> yes, thank you. You've only been really living back <laughs> in Ireland for the last few years. I met you just after yourself and Susan moved into the house that you're in now and started mm -hmm. the Portaferry Perm Permaculture Project. And how many years ago was that now? Uh, about uh, six years ago now. About six years ago, wow, and it's flown by. Um, but you've actually just... lived all over the place. You spent both of you spent a lot of time in Italy, and you're actually yeah. originally from the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, so can you can we rewind back a bit before all of that and all the travels and tell us a bit about how you first got into foraging? How I first got into foraging. Oh, um, I was about 12 maybe, maybe 10, 10, 12. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, I, I, I was, I was, uh, I got, a, I grew up in a little bit of um, a ghetto basically. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a very nice area. The street I, I lived in, um, you know, people, uh, people in my school were told by their parents not to um, mix with kids from our street. Uh, but we were, we we're like a ghetto stuck on the edge of the city. Uh, in Germany, actually, it was. Although I am Dutch, I grew up in Germany, and it was it was a little ghetto on the edge of town. Um, so nature wasn't actually all that far away. Although we were in the ghetto, we were on the edge of town, sort of thing. You know, we were mm. like the working class uh, gypsies and whatnots mm. um, that were pushed to the edge of town. And um, I, I did have a friend from outside the street who came from quite a middle class back background I suppose um, and like ourselves um, who was um, uh, who was with the, um, uh, the, the, the the boy scouts and he um, had a thing about going foraging for medicinal plants um, birch leaves and dandelion and and um, whatever you know all sorts of stuff that that uh, Daisies and and, and uh, you know the obvious kind of the obvious ones. So um, him and me, we went off. We were ten or twelve or something like that, and we went off foraging out into in, in the bogs um, around the city of Bremen, um, uh, foraging. That that was the beginning, really. Uh, it kind of um, developed later, and you know, um, I had I, I developed the nose for mushrooms, and whenever I smelled a mushroom anywhere near me, I disappeared somewhere in the undergrowth and picked something. Um, but I mean, like, um, uh, for, for 15 years, we also lived in England, and I was actually having a full-time job, which is something that didn't particularly suit me, and I didn't get much foraging then, but um, after 15 years, I had enough of that, so we went off to Italy, and we found ourselves in an area which was particularly uh, rich in biodiversity. Uh, it was just absolutely incredible, the stuff you find there, you know, um, so, um, and, and on top of that, we found ourselves running out of money, so we had no money, essentially. Um, no, no incoming money. So we just went and um, looked at the old people of the village who survived the Second World War through foraging, essentially. Um, and um, and they, then they were sort of wandering, wandering around the little alleyways around our village, and I saw see a little old lady, and she disappears off into a hedgerow, and she comes back with a bunch of greens, and I go, oh, what's that? And she goes, oh, it's uh, as wild as asparagus. And I go, oh, nice. You know, well, if they can do that, I can do that, you know. So uh, we kind of started doing that. And um, and within no time, I find myself um, uh, finding over 150 different species of edible plants within an hour's walk from our village um, in different seasons. And that was... Um, that, and plus more, but I mean, that's 150 made it into my book. Um, and uh, yeah, so, um, and we kind of survived from that. We had a plot of land as well. We grew some stuff, but um, uh, we survived on, on, on foraging more because our land was 10 kilometers away from my house. 
Yeah, that's a great story. But wh- whereabouts so, then yeah. did permaculture come into it for you? Well, I mean, we did have a plot of land, and um, it was um, it was a steep plot of land. I mean, we're talking about a forty degree um, average incline, um, eighteen terraces over half an acre, um, and um, it was it was. Uh, uh, really, really tough. And um, uh, you think of Italy, I'm thinking a nice, clement climate, and all nice and sunny and all this sort of thing. Um, the bit in, of Italy we were in, Liguria, just on the border of Tuscany, had about twice as much annual average rainfall than we have here in Porto Ferry in the north of Ireland. Wow. Um, literally. Um, and, uh, and the thing, it, it came down in big, big chunks during the winter. I mean, we're talking like um, uh, what, what, I mean, here, no, Porto Ferry has an average of 800 millimetres a year. Um, in Italy, we had 500 millimetres of rain in a 24-hour period on Christmas Eve 2010. No uh, was way. just chucking it down. You know, I mean... Uh, I'd uh, hold on uh, to the so, crops with your hands. Um, I was, I was <laughs> literally, I mean, <laughs> trees washed down. Well, there were whole trees that washed down Paris. Oh, my God. Uh, it, it was it was just absolutely unbelievable. Devastating, so, so I'm I, sure. I, um, yeah, I, I was writing a blog at the time, which is still quite popular, actually. It was, it was a very, very well-visited blog. It's called Path to Self-Sufficiency.blogspot.com. Um, it's, it still gets um, some 500,000 views a, a month, although I haven't written anything for six years on it. But anyway, so um, uh, I had quite a few followers, and, and some of them sort of said, hey, have you looked at permaculture? And I said, I don't really know anything about it. And um, before I knew there was a course that turned up near us, um, uh, which um, I took and, and, and gave me a lot of the answers that I was looking for, you know, uh, uh, stabilizing the, 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 the uh, steep um, uh, um, area. Um, Zoning it and and, and putting it putting it um, to to um, a good use sort of thing, you know. So um, yeah. that that's, that's what got me into it. I am sure what you've learned about permaculture and foraging and keeping a small holding could probably fill a library at this stage. But could you sum it up into, have you any sort of pearls of wisdom for people? Because keeping small holdings um, is kind of just now sort of becoming, shall we say, trendy again in Ireland, where Mm -hmm. it's gone from a, a case of maybe... 10, 15 years ago, it was my dream, but I didn't really know too many other people my age who were into it. Whereas now, nowadays, it seems like everybody is sort of making some kind of a dash for, you know, a more, a more la- laid back, easygoing kind of lifestyle, you know. Um, could, you, could you leave any pearls of wisdom out there for us young ones who's thinking about uh, getting going in the lifestyle? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the big startup problem is always the, always getting land to start off with. I mean, that's always um, the, the difficult bit. Um, yeah. So, um, but once you do, um, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of cheap land out there, especially in Ireland. Um, uh, so, um, if you see any the, anywhere around you, will you let me know, yeah? No, actually, around here it's not that cheap. Um, you yeah. probably want to go more like uh, funny places like Leitrim or Cavan or Monaghan. Or, yeah, I have sites uh, set on Leitrim. I'd love to get to Donegal, you know, that kind of part of the country. Keep an eye out for me. Yeah, there, there, are, me there, are, there are, yeah, indeed, some good luck to you. I mean, like, there are places out there which are which come quite cheaply. I mean, um, uh, one of the, uh, we were looking at Bulgaria at some stage, which was dirt cheap. If you ever want to go to Bulgaria, I mean, like, you, you, you get, whatever 10 acres with a with a livable house you know which needs a little bit of work for like 10 15 thousand euro wow. um, but anyway that's a different story yeah. uh, <laughs> but um once once you do get your land um 
the, the first the first thing is observation absolutely observation observe mm. what happens around you observe what nature tries to do with your land mm. and let it um you know don't try to control it too much it's um if you try to control it too much it's a hell of a lot of work and um and you're not actually all that successful um um I don't I stop digging, except for the odd potato, obviously, or if I want to plant a tree. Other than that, my 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 spade isn't doing anything. Um, and um, uh, use what's there, you know, and 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 um, and make it as simple as possible. It, it doesn't have to be hard work. I mean, look, I'm 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 heading to what am I now? Fifty eight, I think. I just just turned fifty eight. I'm. Uh, I don't, I don't like breaking my back on digging beds and, and, and digging weeds and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so um, uh, look at what nature does, because nature doesn't do any weeding. It doesn't do any any um, hard work. Um, uh, nature can do most of the work for you. So just observe what your land's trying to do and then um, uh, go with the flow. Go with the flow, my... yeah. Yeah, still trying to learn that one myself. It's hard <laughs> when you've got colonies and colonies of ants taking over your garden and you're just trying to go out sunbathing for an hour, you know, but... <laughs> ah, yeah. I never forget, actually, when you when you were here and you were sort of quite shocked to saying, did you know we have got a load of hogweed in the, in the garden? Yeah. And I told you, yeah, it's yeah. great, isn't it? And you go, yeah. what? <laughs> I, ha- I had been, you know, like a uh, sort of conditioned at that point to think, oh, oh, hogweed, it's probably giant hogweed and it's going to take over the whole property and nothing else will grow. And, you know, and it's it's phototoxic and ah, giant hogweed. Yeah, exactly. And you were like, oh, it's really tasty. Like if you put it on the pan and cook it just right, it's delicious. <laughs> like <laughs> I exactly. still haven't got around to cooking it, but uh, I'm going to be pumping you for recipe suggestions and uh, you might want to bring the, the <laughs> hogweed back up now in a couple of minutes um yeah <laughs> how do you i suppose narrowing it down a little bit how do you find the foraging in ireland like what would your favorite species be um well i'm i'm, I'm in a lucky position that i live near the shore hmm. um and um along the shore is where you get your best foraging in ireland for sure um and uh so um uh, um sea beet for example, mm. is you get it all year round. It's free. It's you get it for nothing. You know, uh, you can pick it all year round around along the shore. You just pick it, just steam it or 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 saute it with a bit of onion, and you have perfect winter greens, summer greens, whatever time of year greens, basically. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's, I mean, there's an abundance of it. I mean, you couldn't over harvest it sort of thing, you know, I mean, like, uh, there's certain things that are protected and other things, whatever, everybody's on about this, what, what do you call that? Um, uh, this, all, all the chefs are on about this, this uh, sea, seaside weed, um, I can't can't even think of it just now. But anyway, they're they're all on about the, these things. But sea beet is so good; it's so easy to eat. It's it never goes bitter, even if it's a really mature plant, um, and it grows there all the time. It's it, absolutely it's, it's, delicious. That's my favorite, the, the one and only time I've tried it was when I was with you that time, and you gave mm. me a sample of it because I knew that you knew what you were picking. I've been at the coast a couple of times since then and gone, hmm, is that the sea beet? But I wasn't quite sure and maybe didn't have the internet on me, so I didn't go for it. But it was really salty, and I remember it being, you know, crispy, really, really crisp. And um, yeah, like you say, it would be nice, you know, summertime and wintertime. I suppose we're blessed to have that we have such a large area of coastline in Ireland um, that people really don't it's not the first Mm, thing they think about when they think about forage and I'm a big fan of mussels when I lived down in Galway City same kind of similar story to yourself uh, was was in university Mm -hmm. at the time and um didn't have used to go out busking at the weekends but you know still sometimes it was a a choice between having an enjoyable weekend and having a decent meal so I very quickly learned where the good mussels grew uh, just outside of Galway city centre you know and the coast really was the place mm-hmm. that I went to as well you know but I wouldn't know much about the leaves from the coast so I'm actually going to 
I think I'll look up a picture of the sea beach and, and edit that in now for people to see uh, exactly what it looks like because I'm pretty sure it's probably all over the place. Sea beach. Oh, Can you yeah. see it now? Yes. That's a lovely picture That's of it sea there. beach. It's got, it's got uh, fairly large leaves. I mean, it's in the winter, they're a bit smaller, but they're quite thick, fleshy leaves. Um, yes. It's basically, it's like, like, um, like um, what do you call it? Uh, Swiss chard. It's the same family. It's it's a wild um, um, thing about Swiss uh, Swiss chard. Yeah. So is there uh, a flower that comes mm, on that, Heiko? Uh, kind of. It looks like. Uh, let me go and find that one. You're okay. Jeez, you're doing better than I'd be. I'd have. There we go. Off. That's what the flower looks like. This this is what the flower looks oh, like. Oh yes, yes, yes. As yeah. So you you have to it, like greenish sort of thing. I'd say that one that's the kind of thing once your eye is trained for it, you could probably spot it a mile away. Oh, I yes, yes, mm. and I mean, like, I mean, along our sh- and along along the, sh- the shores here, mm. I mean, it's it's abundant. I mean, you, you mm. it's just everywhere. I mean, it grows in walls just above the above the um, the, the high tide line. It's mm. everywhere, mm. absolutely everywhere. Mm. Yes, is there a use but, I mean, for the, on, the flowers on, uh, on it? Say, Sorry. Uh, you, you could, I mean, the whole lot is edible, basically. But you use the leaves, um, mm. um, the the seeds. I think would have some medicinal purposes. Um, I, I have a feeling that, if I'm not completely mistaken, um, I remember something about the seeds being good for um, intestinal cancers, um, nice. but. A, um, I'm not sure if there's any any scientific basis mm. for that, but it's been used for that from the herbalists. Mm, mm. So um, yes. Um, so folk and medicine, yes, course, probably overlook- or possibly somewhere. Yes, mm. yes. So um, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I couldn't, I can't um, vouch for that, but um, there, there, there has been used medicinally as well. Yeah, so we're not to hold you medically responsible for what might happen from... Indeed, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get that disclaimer sorted out afterwards, Grant. Absolutely, absolutely. So, like, I mean, a lot of people think that winter is a terrible time of year for foraging, but I'd be pretty willing to bet that you would wholeheartedly disagree. Am I right on that? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, yes and no. I mean, like, um, there's definitely less... Hap- the, the best time is spring uh, for a lot of the fresh greens um, and then autumn for a lot of the, uh, well, the berries, obviously, sort of thing, you know, mm. um, and the nuts. And um, summer isn't the best and winter isn't the best. Uh, mm. Even middle of summer isn't the best time. Mm. Uh, a lot of things go uh, wilt a bit. Um, uh, middle of winter is not the greatest time, but you can't find stuff. I mean, like, um, I was um, I was taking a little film crew um, around uh, a small tidal island in Strangford Loch recently, mm-hmm. um, um, about a month ago. Um, and I wasn't sure, it was actually through the end of October, and I wasn't sure how much we'd still find. And we managed to find a lot. And um, I sort of basically said to them, uh, this is a very small island that's cut off during high tide, mm. um, and um, uh, less than an acre in size. The whole island, I think. Mm. Um, and I said to him, "If you uh, take the top of the island and grew some potatoes on that, um, you could probably live on this island um, and never leave it." Mm. You know, I mean, you'd need something for for carbohydrates, so. I have a I have a bit of where you can have some spuds, and then the rest will seaweeds and seaside plants, mm. um, and mussels and and uh, oysters and whatever wow. winkles and and all that sort of stuff, um, and, and maybe a bit of fishing and whatever. You could live on that island and never leave. Apart from um, when you have to come off it to fight the council occasionally. 
<laughs> well, she <laughs> <what she did. laughs> I'm sure they'd have something to say about that. <laughs> they yes, usually yeah, well, do. That, that island is owned by the by the National Trust, so um, uh, yeah, so not a chance. You to live on it, sort of thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's I mean it's great to have but, yeah, it preserved but, uh, too, where you can go out and see it untouched like that as well, isn't it? I must get you to bring me out yeah, sometime. Exactly. Yeah, so like I mean, talking about like winter foraging, when I was, I just had to ask you about velvet shank. They were when I was researching my first novel, I was sort of looking at things that could be foraged, sort of like the, what's the very last thing you're foraging into the, the the deepest, darkest point of the winter. And you know, I've heard reports of people eating like velvet shank mushrooms, and uh, I, I'll get a picture of those up in a, le- in a little while as well. I've never actually tried them myself, but I've heard they're not the most palatable thing. Have you got any? I mean, do you ever dance with the velvet shank, or uh, is are there other species around the same time that you would prefer to look for? Or, um, I mean, like, in, in, we're talking Ireland here, yeah. Yes. Um. Um. I mean, in, in Italy, that I, I, I foraged all year round because I had to. This was there was there was not a choice. It was a uh, necessity. Mm. Uh, here, I'm in a very lucky position where I don't have to. Um, I do. Uh, I mean, the, the sea beet is something I forage virtually all year round. Yeah. The one thing that I do forage, especially in the winter, especially in the winter, is a three cornered leek oh. uh, type of wild garlic. Um, it's not a native, um, so you don't have to worry about grabbing large chunks of it if you do find it. Um, but where it does grow, I mean, the thing is, it grows it, it, uh, unlike normal wild garlic, like uh, Ramsons. Um, you uh, that that grows from about September to May, mm. literally all winter. You have mm. fresh garlic tasting wow. greens growing there. Um, we have a little holy well near us here. Um, my, my, the, obviously, the, uh, Saint Cui's well. Saint Cui is a little local saint right here, who um, um, well, had a little. He built himself a little temple just by some uh, fresh water springs, just by the shore. Really nice spot, um, and it's absolutely teeming with wild garlic there. Um, so my, my theory is that St. Cui, uh, for, apart from being the, um, the patron saint of um, the hide and seek, and like a Cui, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he also uh, was a hermit uh, out there because he had a, uh, he liked his garlic and he had a bit of a bad breath sort of thing, you know, he was <laughs> absolutely full of garlic there. <laughs> That's my theory about St. Cui. There's not much known about St. Cui other than that. Well, it's, it's, it seems so obvious. Um, you know, you're pro- you're, you must be right, you know. Yeah, so it's kind it, of, it's more, so, it's, indeed. <laughs> it's more garlic and sea beet uh, this this time of year for you than these days. And, and absolutely. I mean, these are the two things, um, especially the, 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 the wild garlic. Um, mm. I, I, I harvest that around the winter and make, make pestles with it and all sorts, you know. Mm. Um, and, and, and literally, I, I just grab big chunks out of it. I mean, it's, 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 it's officially an invasive foreign weed. Um, I, I don't have a problem with it because it grows during the months where virtually nothing else grows. Yeah, it yeah, dies yeah. back in the summer, so it, it doesn't actually outcompete anything else because yeah. it grows. Everything else dies back, and this stuff starts growing. Is yeah. great, you know. <laughs> Plus, it's such a great tonic this time of the year as well to have something that's kind of you know a lot of those uh, alumi things that sort of have that those compounds in them yeah. that the garlic and onions would have are great for cleansing your system and you know keeping your immune exactly. system strong and and all that yeah. kind of thing. It's it's perfect time of year for it. So it's like Absolutely. a little Christmas present from the earth, isn't it? Indeed, indeed. Unlike yeah. velvet yeah, and get it all winter. <laughs> or so I've heard. Yes. Mm. I have I have one more question about mushrooms. I know you're not really picking them these days, but I know you've picked many in your lifetime. And m- myself and Dave are in an area that's a lot richer than we initially thought for them at the minute. So we're we're getting well into it. Um 
So like when it comes to going out and foraging mushrooms, there are whole groups, like subgroups within the foraging category dedicated to picking mushrooms because obviously it can be such a a dicey pastime uh, if you don't know what you're doing. And most of the good advice uh, in the books and on the internet will advise you that you should learn species by species until you can 100% positively identify the species that you're picking and just pick one up at a time so that you're you're quite sure of what you're eating and obviously for anyone listening to this keep a little bit of the mushroom behind in case you need to bring it to a and e with you afterwards um so I have to ask how many species of mushrooms have you accumulated in that brain of yours over the years? How many do you reckon you Um, could confidently identify? No. Um, Mushrooms is not my strong point. um, Mm. I've done some mushrooms. I've done quite a few. Um, I probably, well, I can count them on, on my two hands anyway. Uh, of what I would confidently pick in the way of mushrooms. Here, I don't find many, where I am, in particular the region where I am, there isn't much in the way of mushrooms. It's yeah. very intensely, um, uh, it's very intense agriculture around right here. So I have plenty yeah. of um, an- antifungals and hence not many mushrooms. Um, there's yeah. there's about a, 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 literally about a couple of handfuls of, of mushrooms that I will confidently pick. The reason, uh, that, I mean, that, that, um, when I when I go for plants, I have a I have a rule of thumb for plants. Um, uh, you look at something and you're not quite sure what it is. Yeah. So you look at it, you get get an idea of the family, then you go smell it. Smells nice. Smells horrible. Mm-hmm, okay. And if you're thinking, all oh, right, this might be something. It might be edible. You taste just a tiny little bit. Mm. And if it tastes good, a plant, this is a plant, right? Different kingdom than mushrooms, plant. Mm. Um, if it tastes good, in my experience, it is good. If it tastes bad, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. But if it tastes good, it is good. Um, so anything you taste, um, you know, you've, you've looked at it and you're thinking, oh, this might be in this family and this might be this. And you've sniffed it and it smells quite pleasant and you tasted it and it tastes pleasant. Mm. then it is good. With mushrooms, that rule of thumb does not work. Yes. It's uh, so much harder taste to tell. Delicious, um, and, 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 and they might not even kill you straight away. It, m- it <laughs> might take a week before the liver goes sort of thing, yes. you know. You're thinking, oh, this went all right. And then a, li- a week later, um, you know, your your liver um, decides to pack up. And um, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lot trickier. Um, than than it is with plants. Well, I have Uh, to say to you, you know, um, I know maybe you feel like it isn't an an awful lot, but I mean, even 10 species, being able to, you know, confidently uh, identify 10 species of mushrooms, I think that's that's a very... That's a very reasonable amount and and an amount that you can be proud of, you know, because I I would say there's maybe maybe two for me. You know, I like uh, the the penny buns, the porcinis. What do you call them here? The... um, Bullet. Dave just came back in the door and reminded me it's a bullet. And there's a lot of different kinds of species of those. Bullet, but yes. we've yes, probably yes. I've probably encountered maybe two or three different kinds at this stage. So um mm. and, and that's probably that's probably about it for me. I've had some field mushrooms as well, which I was quite confident about, but it really is something you, you don't want to go trekking with. Like and I think, yeah, ten species and a healthy fear yeah. of uh, or a healthy respect for fungus. You know, that's 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 a, a, a yes. lot to show for a lifetime. I, go. I think you've done I mean, very I, well for your I mean, years. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot I, better I take, than most. I take people. I take people on 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 wild food forages, um, but I will always always exclude mushrooms i will not take anybody on a mushroom uh, people ask me if i could and i, I say I, no I, I won't do that personally i won't do that there are people yeah. who are very good at it i mean there are thousands there are thousands of, of species of fungi mm. um and um I, I i um i'm not good enough at that i'm afraid and and um around here there's not i mean certainly in my particular bio 
region where I am. Mm. There are not that many anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, I see the parasols and I see bits and pieces uh, of all the, um, what do you call them, um, um, the puffballs. Oh, um, yeah. And that's 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 about all I've uh, found around here. Well, you've already said now your favourite time of year for foraging is the springtime. What are you most yeah. kind of looking forward to when it's the signs of the new year and new growth coming around? What species? All the, all the green stuff, basically. Mm. Uh, there's, there's, I mean, for a start, hogweed. We mentioned hogweed earlier, the young shoots of hogweed. Uh, they're really delicious. I mean, you got to be careful when you when you collect them so you don't get them on your skin and you don't get the burns um uh, so best to, to, to uh, but basically you just peel them lightly and and then steam them it's it's um like like uh, like celery with um with uh, with a kick to it it's, it's it's really really nice it's really tasty um you get i mean you, you know, things like dandelion uh, leaves are best in the spring dandelion flowers are really nice you can mix them into cookies at, instead of saffron da- um uh Virtually everything green that comes out in the spring is just delicious. Um, you know, um, when it grows a little bit later in the summer, everything becomes a bit more bitter and everything, you know, but in the spring, everything is just fresh and it cleanses your body. It's it's one of those things, um, as w- one of the things that I always say to people when I when I take them on, on, on wild food forages, whatever grows at any one time, at any one place, is exactly what your body needs at that time and place. Um, if you start in spring, you have all those fresh young greens that come out. You're down the lions and 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 the likes, um, and your your um, uh, everything, all the young greens, um, and they are most of them are nettles and all this. They're they're cleansing your body, the the the, the, the your your blood, your liver, your kidneys, everything um, gets cleansed really nicely. Then in, in the summer you get the more uh, high uh, sugar content of things like berries and then and, and, um, and your whatever courgettes and your tomatoes and, and all the all the things that i mean obviously then it's not for foraging but all the things that are actually in season and ripe in the summer are all relatively high in sugar you have a longer um day you have more active day and you sort of work your uh, so you basically your body needs to sort of keep going because with all those high sugar and um, uh, foods that are available at that time. Then in autumn, you get your your um, uh, root vegetables and your um, uh, also in the wild and, and your nuts. And they are uh, slow release sugars. Um, they're also storable and 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 you sort of build up your 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 body weight a little bit with all those heavier starchier foods um that are also you're going to be eating during the winter because this is what 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 you're going to have to sustain yourself on over the winter uh and by the time spring comes along again you your body needs cleansing because you've been eating all those high starch foods so it's it's whatever grows at any one time it's exactly what your body needs at that time at, I'm just saying I'd buy that book if you wrote it. Hint, hint. I, I'm working on it. I'm working on <laughs> <Yay>! it. Yay! <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> well, we are looking forward to it very much. It, it'll be a little while left. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. You take your time. But, I mean, talking about right things that you need at certain times of year, you know, that doesn't mean that we don't preserve food. Yeah, of course. I know you preserve course, food, yes. but do you preserve much food? Um, I mean, like, um, a, 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 yeah, a reasonable amount. Uh, again, less so than I used to when I was living with no money. Mm. Um, but yeah, I do. I mean, I make jams. Um, I've got a big chest freezer full of, I mean, we've had about, I don't know, half a ton of raspberries this year. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of berries in general. Um, so um, they, they've they been frozen, they've been made into jams. Um, we've got an absolute ton of um, um, Bramley apples, so I made chutney and, 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 and whatever stuff with that. Um, so um, the, 
elderberries and uh, yeah, so I preserve a lot of, especially the fruit. Um, mm. I've, I've preserved, uh, I do a little thing, a little, little German thing, which is called Rumtopf, um, uh, which is basically you sort of start with strawberries from the beginning of the season or raspberries or whatever comes first and you throw it in a big earthenware pot and then you put a bit of sugar on it and you top it up with rum and then you whenever the next fruit becomes ripe you throw some of that in there a bit more sugar a bit more rum and you keep going and um, now right about now we start eating the stuff uh, which is absolutely delicious you know it preserves the fruit really really well uh, keeps the, um, the the vitamins and uh, a little bit of the alcohol for some reason, but it's really lovely. I know <laughs> it's just, it's it's a, it's probably very medicinal, Heiko. Indeed, I think it is. Yes, yeah. yes it's full of vitamins stuff. And, um, yeah, absolutely. So, so what um, what tasty preserves are you going to have, say, with your Christmas feast then this year? Well, that rum truffle feature, I think. Mm-hmm. There's also I made uh, what uh, I've made some. I'm um, usually I make something called Christmas jam. My my original Christmas jam uh, recipe I developed in Italy, uh, which had uh, weird things like autumn olive berries, which is not olives, but it's a it's a they grew wild in Italy. So uh, unfortunately, it doesn't grow wild here. But uh, that was a, a, a um, and then there was. It was really high in in in, in um, um, antioxidants and stuff like that and vitamins, um, plus some myrtle that I uh, picked in Italy wild and some strawberry tree uh, fruit. You know the strawberry fruit tree, the um, the uh, Killarney strawberry. Yes. You heard of the Killarney strawberry? Yes. Like, um, so all that grew wild in Italy. Um, and it was always around about November that it ripened all those three fruits. So I made oh. a, a, a jam with that, with with uh, different um, spices to make it really Christmassy, you know, like cinnamon and stuff like that. Um, so unfortunately, here I don't have the same uh, um, fruits. So I've made it this year with apples from, from some some Bramley apples from my ap- apple tree and some um, elderberries. Plus the Christmas spices, nice. so um, then I, so I make some biscuits with that Christmas jam. So um, uh, that that'll be that'll be featuring. Oh my god, my my mouth is actually water. <laughs> Listen to that. <laughs> uh, gotta... Yeah, might be knocking your door at Christmas. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Oh my god, that just sounds amazing, Heiko. Um you know, it's it's frustrating that we don't have like any of those things here. Um I mean the closest probably we have is I made a winterberry tonic uh, a few months back. It was just before I started vlogging, so I got some, you know, very colorful pictures, but I didn't get any footage or the recipe. But I'm gonna try it again for mm. next year. And it was all the things that you know we were kind of past, and I ended up with a, a glut of uh, fruit from my dad's house and at the same time we were doing a lot of foraging so I was trying to get rid of all the bigger kind of fruits and and alcohols and things like that but I wanted some kind of a tonic for over the winter and we had elderberries rose hips we had uh, some frozen um, black currants from our garden and you know I put some ginger and some lemon balm I had in the garden into it and stuff as well and it's absolutely amazing it's like stuff that you put on top of uh, the ice cream you know like the red syrup it's so nice and it's and it's lovely if you put a wee tipple or something into it as well completely medicinal that's you uh, know i've i've made quite a, when i was in italy um i made quite a lot of uh, liqueurs from everything i mean um the thing is in italy you can buy i mean this uh, if, if you uh, in a supermarket an ordinary supermarket in italy can buy a litre bottle of virtually pure alcohol, 95% uh, potable alcohol for 11 euro a litre. Oh, no, you're, oh, you're right? killing me. That, so if, many if things that, that you need a, is, that level of alcohol for. If you, you have that really in a supermarket here, you'd probably have dead... Yeah, if you'd have that in a supermarket here, you'd have probably have dead, dead people in the streets. But people yeah. there literally yeah. buy it <laughs> in to, to, to make liqueurs. Yeah. So basically, because it's so high alcohol, it, it extracts the flavors and the and the goodness from 
from everything you put into it, whatever, if it's fruit or if it's herbs or if it's whatever else, you know, and, and you just put it in there and it really extracts everything out of that. Mm. And then um, after in Italy, basically you do a liqueur, you soak something for 40 days, 40 days, whatever it is, there's 40 days. And then wow. you sort of um, uh, pour it off and you add some sugar and you add some water um, to get it to a sensible strength. You know, you obviously don't want to be drinking it at 95%. Um, you water it down to a similar sensible strength with water and sugar. Mm. And you have whatever, like, three four liters of of liqueur oh, which is really really tasty and then you yes. make liqueurs from all seasonal the, liqueurs all... all year round like oh my god exactly and you make it from from things that you don't um you, you normally don't even use sort of thing you know i make like a lemon liqueur from mm. the peels of the lemon so you eat your lemon and you use the skin of the of the lemon and put it in alcohol mm. and it becomes a lemon a melon alcohol a lemon liqueur um, and the same with um, cherry pips make one with cherry pips tasted like marzipan it's absolutely amazing no way I, I, I never forget i went into a restaurant in italy and i've tried that afterwards myself and i went to a restaurant in italy and um you know uh, a tiny little village restaurant and we were eating afterward and, and then afterwards the guy he obviously realized you were foreign sort of thing you know said hey would you like a little liqueur for for uh, uh, your after afterwards and i said yeah okay so um came something out of an unmarked bottle and he sort of pulls it out and, and he's and i sort of said oh what is it he said guess and i was like hmm smells a bit of cherry he says very good it's made from cherry leaves wow. leaves of cherry tree you know literally <laughs> tasted of shared cherry it's, and you know you, you make liqueurs from things that you normally throw away. I mean, like limoncino is made from lemon skins. <sighs> you know, um, you, you use the juice and then you throw the the, the skins into, into some alcohol and you make liqueur out of it. So you can make lots of really nice liqueurs from, from, from weird and wonderful ingredients. Yeah. And they're really tasty. <laughs> I've, been, I've been actually craving limoncello the last probably 12, 12 months or so. I... I think it was it was a, a being away on holidays <laughs> that that ruined me, and then I got back to Ireland and I couldn't find limoncello from you know when I when I wanted it. Uh, it's just it wouldn't be terribly uh, common here uh, outside of the uh, summertime. There are two different things: limoncino and limoncello. Oh right, okay. Limoncello, limoncello is made from the skin. Yes, and limoncello is made from the juice. Ah, very very important difference, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah um so the the lemon chino would be more bitter would it? A little, yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, to me better balance to it mm, mm-hmm. because yeah. you get the sweetness that's um, it the bitterness. lemon shell was very very sugary it was probably why i like it <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a sucker for I can't drink at all I'm a sucker for like alcohol pops and terrible things like that but I'm trying my best now we've been we've made some really nice things we had apple brandy uh, you know like apple infused brandy uh, hot toddies at, at Halloween there and um, yeah there was some gin done and some whiskey done and some vodka done that went into some cocktails as well so i mean it was just an excuse to put cinnamon and more things for me really <laughs> At christmas dinner for starters um good thing to eat um for a, i mean i'm not vegan or vegetarian um and um pheasant is a good one oh, yeah. or 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 um or, or venison for that matter, um, both wild meats. So you have you 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 don't. I mean, you can't get any more free range than a pheasant or 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 a, or a deer. Um, so um, rather than than um, than a whatever turkey or a, something held in a little pen for ages. So that that's my first recommendation. You'll go for wild meats rather than 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 anything that may have been in a very tiny cage for a very long time, yeah. uh, unless you know where they come from. They're so much um, more interesting to use as leftovers as well. Like I find that the game birds. Um, I would have an uncle who every year would acquire a few braces of pheasants. Now he doesn't shoot them himself, but he's one of the people that they get offloaded on when there's a lot of them. 
uh, you know, shot by one guy. So quite a few of the years I've ended up with pheasants and um Although I never actually would have made them for Christmas dinner, I'd be looking for ways sort of around Christmas to get rid of them. And uh, I found one year, you know, putting a bit of, um, I was very into sort of cooking uh, Thai, Thai with Thai ingredients at the time. And I mm-hmm. had some star anise and some coconut milk and some cinnamon in there with it. And it was like really delectable, unusual sort of, um, you know, mix of flavors. But it's just like a real luxury that if you went and had it in a in a, in a five star restaurant, you'd, you'd well believe that it was you know, worth every penny of the exorbitant price. But there it was from just, you know, food that was kind of going anyway. It was on offer well, the, and... The, the thing is as well, I mean, I, I go to... We have a little local butcher in, in Porta Ferry here. Mm. And I mean, he knows that I'm into my wild meats sort of thing. You know, I go in there, I say, oh, I got a pheasant or I got some, some, some venison and stuff like that because he knows I'm after that sort of thing, you know. But basically... Um, people here don't eat it much, you know, I said, oh, poor Bambi and all that sort of thing, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's, a, um, especially, well, venison even more so than, 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 uh, than pheasant. Um, if we didn't control them, I mean, they've, they've, they haven't got their, their natural predators in Ireland anymore. They haven't mm-hmm. got any wolves or bears eating them. So if we were to let, um, um, deer, uh, grown wild and not shoot them, they, they, they would, there would not be any, any regrowth of forests. I mean, whenever we try to regrow a forest, they'd eat all the young um, shoots, and um, you know, you couldn't regenerate a forest. So that they do need controlling um, mm. if, uh, uh, because their natural predators are gone. So we are there that you are their only natural predator. Mm. So they do need shooting, uh, mm. essentially. And so, it can be a um, controversial opinion in this area, like, but you know, there are there's everybody that sort of has a very strong opinion on it, has their reason and behind it. I kind of be in the you know the same boat as you there. Well, sometimes you know things die or nature decides that you know, or as you're saying, like control of kind of population that that's kind of as permaculture does replicate in the cycle of nature itself, and that there needs to be yeah. sort of a natural predator prey cycle. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that that rather than waste the waste the meat, you know, that is kind of being produced well anyway, it. that it should be eaten by somebody, you know, and Indeed. um better again if you can, you know, as as much of the the carcass as, as can be used, uh, you Absolutely. know, the better. So it's um, actually it's actually cheaper meat as well, and it, it, yeah. it's and it, people people don't eat it here, you know, they they rather have beef or 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 whatever you know um, or pork um, and and these things uh, that they're, they're more often than not uh, not uh, a really sustainable sort of thing you know unless you ex- uh, know exactly where 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 your beef or your your pork comes from mm-hmm. um, it more often than not it's not sustainable was was things like 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 um, uh, venison that, that is a sustainable meat and there's also no, there's no no i mean it, unless it's sort of like shooting for a hunt for a shoot, shoot uh, hunting for for sport mm. uh with dogs and all that sort of thing but basically normally it's just a gun a shot straight straight, straight through and it's it's dead it never knew what happened sort of thing you know mm. so um if you if, if you have to have meat then then th- those are much better meats to have mm. and then yes and as far as leftovers is concerned yes eat as much as possible, give the rest of the dog and the chickens and the and whatever, you know. Um, so, um, and, 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 and compost, whatever, is still left over sort of thing, you know, <laughs> basically don't throw it in the bin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you'd probably get a stock out of the bones too, if you were clever about it as well. Oh, uh, yes, that too. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm. I want to ask you just before you go, where is the best place for people to find your book if they'd like to have a look at it? You have one, have one lying about nearby. Um, it's uh, published, I mean, it is on Amazon, um, but Amazon pay you peanuts, as yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, it is published by, called Pilgrimage Publications. Pilgrimage. Yeah. Publications. So it's available on their website, a, and you probably it's get a slightly It's available on their website. Mm. Otherwise, you can just ask me. I have a probably a dozen copies knocking about the house. 
Can you just mention the uh, name of your, your blog for us again, please? Oh, uh, I haven't written anything on that one for That's six okay. years. That's uh, okay. It's still a, a big archive. Path, path to selfsufficiency.blogspot.com. And are you still are you still signed up to the Woofing program when things start coming Not back to normal? I'm, I'm, no, uh, World Packers, Workaway, Helpex, um, we're on all three. Um, we got a couple others, but these are the mo- the three main ones. World Packers is actually the one I get most people through at the moment. But I mean, like, I, 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 I we got a, the obviously the Facebook page as well, where I, I with the last help we had in October, she just contacted me via the Facebook page of um, Port of Ferry Permaculture uh, Project. And uh, she was an American woman. She said, hey, do you take volunteers? I said, yep, when you want to come. And she came for a month. So, I mean, like, it's it's uh, can can go. It, it a lot, often it goes through word of mouth way as well. Mm, okay. That is fantastic. Heiko, thank you so much for talking to us this evening. It has been Best. very, uh, very been enlightening and so enjoyable. Great pleasure talking to you. As well. You and too. Days, and yes. love to Susan and to Carrots. <laughs> Love to you, Susan. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. (laughs) Thanks so much.